All right, guys, thanks for jumping on this and uh, tuning in with me here. Uh, really, before I get into this little webinar or presentation or whatever here today, I uh, just wanted to kind of send my best wishes out to everybody, uh, whether you're affected by this, you know, from the, the COVID itself or just the kind of the economic repercussions of it. I know uh, like 99% of my industry is shut down right now, so just wanted to say, uh, you know, hang in there and and hopefully this can uh, this along with you know other people um, can kind of help get you through and uh, help to occupy your time. I know a lot of people aren't necessarily accustomed to spending their time by themselves and being isolated. And frankly, it's just a <laughs> kind of a weird time right now. But anyhow, uh, felt uh, kind of compelled to you know want to do my part here and and throw something together. Uh, you know, and again, hopefully this can help some of you guys out and you can take something from it. But um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I'm just going to do this thing in one take and, um, you know, going to just kind of go off the cuff here. So hopefully I can, I can hit on this, but, um, what I wanted to get into here today, and I'm going to do a couple of these. And as you can see up in the corner here, um, calling this hashtag COVID ops, um, just really trying to focus my time while we have it and, uh, put together some good shit. So hopefully this hits the mark, but Let's jump in. So we're going to go through um, methods and principles for programming today. And uh, really, this is just going to be kind of a broad stroke. I'll, I'll talk some about, you know, some of the general and, con and conventional methods of programming and periodization. And then we'll kind of take a look at how I apply it in a couple of different ways. And, um, you know, just the variability and some of the considerations that come with programming. So let's jump on in here. <clears throat> those of you who aren't too familiar with me, um, just a quick background on, on, you know, what I've done, where I'm at, and where I'm going. Uh, did my undergrad and my master's at, at Old Dominion, uh, both in exercise science. Uh, obviously, you know, been NSCA for a while now. Been working at VHP for going on four years now. Uh, most of you should be pretty familiar with, with the work that we're doing there. Um, and then, you know, as of just over a year ago, uh, my wife and I launched our own personal professional site, Rude Rock. Uh, you know, just uh, kind of the the dichotomy of strength and conditioning and, and Olympic weightlifting all blended into one. And then at some point here in the future, uh, I'll be working for the Raiders out in Las Vegas as the head strength coach. Still waiting on them to get back to me, but uh, we'll hear back soon, hopefully. VHP is a pretty interesting place. Um, we work with a, uh, a really interesting population, and it's uh, really kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things uh, as it applies to programming. Really, what I've taken since I've been at VHP is that there there are really no rules to programming. It's it's really a matter of being a critical thinker and a problem solver more than anything else. But at VHP, we like to say it's a delicate balance between performance and rehabilitative training. You know, we're constantly working with uh, athletes with injuries and um, you know, at the same time, they they all have a very strict timeline on, you know, when they need to be where they need to be. So it creates for uh, some interesting outcomes and uh, some interesting methods. But we work mostly with Spec Ops, spec, Special Force. And as you guys know, I really only even mention that just so I can provide some context for, you know, where my thinking is and, and what my work really means. Um, but the, the crux of it all is that all of them are just really, really, really beaten down with injuries. <clears throat> like I mentioned, Rude Rock, uh, hobbyist thing that's kind of becoming, you know, something a little bit more. Um, you know, we've had a lot of, lot of success with this early on and, and people have really been great about giving good feedback and, and kind of helping us navigate the ship here. But kind of like we're, we are right now, you know, our goal is simple. Just really want to put out good, good content and, um, talk about strength and conditioning and Olympic weightlifting stuff, really. So for this, what we can expect here is um, looking at some of the big picture items, some of the conventional stuff we've all been familiar with uh, in our undergrad and, and in our credentialings coming up. Um, but, you know, never a bad time to relook at some of that stuff. And from there, we'll take it into some of my personal pillars for programming and, you know, what I try to put emphasis on and what I'm looking at. From there, we'll look at the importance of the assessment, how that kind of dictates and, and really sets the tone for, for the programming 
part of it. You know, I think uh, a big part of this is really just letting the athlete tell you what they need. Um, and then we'll get into some of the different applications and how it can be uh, modified based on your population. And then we'll round out here with, uh, you know, adding some layering to your to your training to really hone in on the uh, specificity part and how to optimize. And again, like I said, please take some of this with a grain of salt. Um, I do work in somewhat unique circumstances, so a lot of the things that I'm doing now are really difficult to apply if you know you just have the standard three days a week or you know working with 10, 10 athletes at a time uh, you know some of this stuff may kind of slip through the cracks for you but uh, I tried to do my best to, to make it um, you know carry over for more of a, a general population as well starting out here with the big picture items most of you should be familiar with this list uh, this is the conventional laws of strength training so number one, we have uh, law of individual difference. So this is just a, a way of saying, you know, specificity and individuality are needed. Um, the way I've always interpreted that is that which gets emphasized gets improved. So again, looking at the assessment and the evaluation and the interview and, and you know, letting them tell you and show you what they need is, is really kind of step number one here. Um, two, we have the accommodation principle. Uh, training should progress from general to specific. I think most people are on board with that. Uh, you need to generalize before you specialize. Number three, progressive overload. Uh, you don't overload, you won't grow. That one's pretty pretty straightforward. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this here in a minute. But, you know, I think what we get confused with on this is that, you know, if you can bench press 315 pounds, you know, in order to get a stimulus or an effect that you need to work to train or work to lift more than 315 pounds. And in theory, yeah, that's true. But there are also some other ways that we can create overload without it just being, you know, more weight on the bar. Number four, uh, general adaptation system syndrome. So this again is, is one that we should all be familiar with. I know there isn't a physiology class in the world that doesn't, you know, build off of this. But as we know, shock resistance and exhaustion are kind of the three phases of this. Number five, use disuse principle reversibility so again no training no gaining if you if you don't work it's, it, it will diminish and lastly law of dy dynamic correspondence um, this is just another fancy way of saying specificity uh, my interpretation of this is it should be an athlete driven model and outcome so you know you have your your basic uh, foundations and pillars for what you believe should be done you know for strength training and conditioning method but you're never glued to those to the point where it, it negates what the athlete uh, in front of you needs. And this is just a, a good image of supercompensation, which is, uh, you know, again, something we should be mostly familiar with, but it's just creating adaptation through overload. So as you see, we have an initial performance level here. We train, it beats us down. We recover, we come back up. Then we have this supercompensation effect. We train again and we go down again, but you notice that the diminishing returns here is is actually higher than it was in that first cycle. This is typically over the course of you know two to four weeks or so, um, but anyhow, that diminishing point is actually higher, so that when we rebound again, whoop, when we rebound again after recovery, um, we recover and then supercompensate at a higher rate, and then it just continues to build from there. This is great in theory, as we all know, this has limiting uh, factors to it and it's, it never works this beautifully, but again, organizing it theoretically, this is kind of what you want to have in mind. Some other things to consider here, uh, can't talk about strength and conditioning without talking about Newton's three laws, law of inertia, force equals mass times acceleration, and equal and opposite effect. So although these things may not have specific points that you need to think about when it comes to writing out a program, I think it's very important to comprehend these and understand what the, the ramifications of them are after the fact so that we don't double down or we're not missing the boat on something as we go throughout our program. Sherrington's Law, uh, which is the disinhibition, disinhibition of antagonist muscles or um, reciprocal inhibition. So uh, basically this is saying, you know, when you flex your quad, your hamstring needs to relax to be able to work correctly. There are definitely some caveats to this and definitely some outliers to this, but again, in principle, this is a good one to know. Bilateral deficit effect. This is one that really hits home for me and, and is very prevalent in my world because of the high rate of injuries. 
um, but the bilateral deficit effect, although there are several different theories on it, uh, my belief is the neuromuscular theory in which um, basically it is a kind of a neuro, or I'm sorry, kind of an, uh, a potentiation effect where when we train, um, say we're doing like a single arm dumbbell press with the right arm, there's actually a neurological stimulus that goes to the left arm as well. So uh, although this isn't, you know, something that's going to add mass or add strength in and of itself, you know, I'm not saying if you just press with the right arm, your left arm is going to be the same, but there is an effect. So I think that for motor control purposes and for neuromuscular reasons, uh, bilateral deficit is an important one to know. Post-activation potentiation, uh, one of the coolest things in the world to say, but um, this was a big hitter uh, three or four years ago. People really started to kind of, you know, espouse this one and, and get into, you know, the effects of this on social media and stuff. And, you know, here's another one that has a lot of different theories to it. And, you know, some people think that it's bullshit and some people think that it's overhyped and it, it very well may be. But personally, this is one of my favorite things uh, to include in training, you know, that the contrast methods and, and you know, going from something super heavy to super light, uh, you know, back to back to back. I, I just think that there's something to it that, that helps the body and, and, and works really well. Um, you know, I think that the neuromuscular and biochemical effects of it are, are probably, um, you know, the best uh, theory that we have out right now. Um, and that basically being an overstimulation of the nervous system, right? So if we uh, look at like French contrast methods, you know, you do a back squat at 90% and then you do a back squat at 45% and then you go and do a, you know, broad jump or a counter movement jump. Uh, the theory here is that the 300 or the 90% back squat will stimulate the nervous system. And then when you go to the 45% back squat, it'll still think that it's 90%. So it's almost like an overstimulation effect. And then there's some biochemical aspects to this as well, you know, uh, surplus of calcium, uh, in the channels and, and, you know, basically creating an oversaturated, uh, potential to fire. So a lot of different theories, but again, it's another one that I think just really works well with, uh, higher level athletes. Biotensegrity, this has been my big kick for about a year, year and a half now. Um, I won't get too much into this in this presentation because I'm probably going to do a follow-up just on biotensegrity. But, uh, the main thing you need to know about biotensegrity is that, um, it's, it's, uh, based around the fascial system. Uh, the fascial system is an incredibly powerful system in the human body and it is, it responds differently than muscle. So in my opinion, that should have some effects on, uh, exercise selection. And then similarly, similarly here with, uh, action perception coupling. So this is something that's really big with, uh, Sean Meitzka, uh, who, uh, works out of Minnesota. Um, and then I know Ross Cooper is big on this too. If you guys are on Twitter. Um, I have admittedly not delved too deep into this, so I don't want to speak on it like I know what I'm talking about, but my understanding of it is, is basically this is the most sport specific way you can go about things, um, you know, in terms of, uh, trying to simulate a natural effect. So that can have some effects on, you know, your, your movement selection and how you lay things out as well. <clears throat> Now we'll get into uh, my pillars of programming and, and really what I try to emphasize, um, you know, when I'm putting things together or when I'm, you know, working with some of my other coaches. Um, I think that all of the, the conventional stuff uh, that, you know, is of course important and, and we definitely need to be very proficient with that. Um, but I also think it's important for you to kind of come up with your own pillars of programming and, and you know, really do what makes sense to you and, um you know, kind of take ownership of, of how you go about your process. One of the biggest things that, one of the biggest mistakes that I made early on was, you know, thinking that, uh, you know, I had to write something that was exactly the way that the NSCA presented it or so-and-so presented it. And, you know, if it didn't look like that, then it probably wasn't good. And really what it ended up leading into was I was just distributing programs that even I didn't really understand very well. And so when athletes would have issues with them, um, I wasn't really able to navigate or solve those, um, because I didn't understand it well enough. So, I totally re-scrapped my method and, um, you know, kind of put it in my preferences first and then kept all the conventional stuff in, you know, not on the back burner, but it probably came second to the way that it made sense to me. So rolling through these here, we have, uh, you're never married to anything. Uh, by far, that's the most important part of this. Um, I've, you know, gone through all of the different phases of 
you know, functional training. And then I, you know, got into more of the, um, you know, Joe DeFranco and West Side Barbell. And, you know, I've gone through all the, the, uh, the Cressy programs and, you know, Mike Boyle's approach. And I really just tried everything and, and anything that seemed appealing or something that uh, caught my attention, I would give it a shot. But uh, what it led me to was that there's good shit in all of them. You know, none of them are perfect, but there's good stuff in all of it. So, you know, you want to try different things and see what sticks and, and kind of kick what doesn't. But the biggest mistake you can make is, is thinking that, oh man, it's, if you're not doing it the West side method, then you're not doing it right. Or, you know, if you're not doing functional movement screening, you're not doing it right. Uh, I think that's just very short, short sighted. And, um, you know, it's just not that simple. So second here we have, uh, the right program is the best program. So tying right into that, you know, uh, the, the goal is to make the athlete better when they leave than when they came to see you. So, if you're not able to adapt on the fly and, and kind of, you know, manipulate programming to fit, to fit the needs of the athlete in front of you, then you're just kind of missing the boat. Three, the program is only effective as your ability to coach it. Another big point, you know, and this, uh, again, is, is something that I had trouble with early on where, you know, I would have something that may have been perfect on paper, but if I didn't know how to organize it or implement it into my training um, or into action, rather, uh, then how effective was it really? Four, this has been the biggest point of, of my time at VHP. Um, always have a plan, always know that plan's gonna change. So, you know, it's almost kind of funny, uh, you know, for as, as on par as Vernon and I are, um, you know, we go t about programming in a totally different way. Uh, you know, he's much more free flowing, ebbs and flows, kind of off the cuff and can keep everything organized in his, in his head. Uh, whereas I'm the total opposite. I need to I need to write down every single thing I can and. Uh, try to have as best of a, a cohesive plan ahead of time as possible. Um, but case in point, um, you know, there are limitations on both ends. You know, for me, my limitations were, you know, putting together these perfect programs for everybody and then coming in on Monday or Tuesday and, and having to change, you know, 50% of it right off the jump. Um, you know, and it, at first it was definitely a frustrating thing and kind of a detractor. But, you know, now that I'm prepared for that and know that there's going to be um, you know, some, some variable shifts and some things just aren't going to go the way I want them to. Um, you know, it's just good to have a, a secondary plan at all times. Number five, uh, another huge point that I think a lot of young coaches miss, especially is you got to take explicit notes. Um, you know, the, the saying is that which gets measured gets managed. Um, you know, I think it's very similar uh, with taking notes, right? You know, putting down the details, putting in the things that, that they give you, the feedback, the input, you know, hey, this made my shoulder feel great. This made my knee tweak and feel weird on this, you know, making sure that you don't double down on your mistakes or on things that um, don't fit with what the athlete needs. Uh, it's just important that you stay on top of it. And I know once you start getting into working with, you know, higher volumes of athletes, it can be hard to, to stay on top of everybody. But take explicit notes, and then uh, importantly, read those notes, go back and reread them and then apply it. <clears throat> so this kind of just, uh, again, following up on, you know, everything I already just talked about, but I think that if I had to pick two out here, I would say that this is definitely one. And then this is probably two, uh, maybe two A, two B here. Um, you know, this is the, the biggest point that you really need to emphasize, though, is that you don't do anything one way or the other. There's constant evolution. There's constant uh, reassessment. You're always looking into new things and seeing how, you know, different coaches are applying some of the same things that you may be using. But you can't be committed to one thing, especially early on, because you're going to miss the boat on a lot of things that are out there. Now looking at uh, periodization 101 here. Um, these are the empirical steps to successful strength training. Um, this is something that was introduced to me a while ago by somebody, honestly, I don't even know who to give credit to on this, but um, you know, this is the easiest way that I can, I can illustrate programming. Step one is we're gonna get in shape to train. Step two, we're gonna get big muscles. Step three, make big muscles strong. Step four, make strong muscles fast. Step five, rinse, wash, repeat. So we'll break these down here individually. <clears throat> mm. 
number one, getting in shape to train. Biggest thing here is we want to make sure that we are in good enough shape to be able to train hard. So I know that aerobic training gets a really, you know, interesting rap from a lot of people. Um, you know, we look at uh, like football, basketball, and uh, I mean, baseball is probably not a good example here, but football and basketball, and, you know, we're always like, you know, alactic, 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 and, um, you know, it's, it's a seven to 10 second play or, you know, in basketball, it's an explosive type action. That's all absolutely true. But what I think people kind of misunderstand is that developing a, developing an aerobic base does not mean you need to become a marathoner. You know, it's just a reasonable aerobic base to work off of. And something that I stole from Mike Boyle is uh, a good value for that is 60 beats per minute for resting heart rate. So the way that Boyle looks at it is, is if your resting heart rate is below 60 beats per minute, there's probably not much aerobic improvement that you need to do um, unless you're an aerobic athlete. Uh, you know, if you're over 60 beats per minute for resting heart rate value, you're probably going to benefit from some aerobic training. So I just think that it's a, uh, it's extremely important for all athletes, especially young athletes to just be in good shape. And, you know, we, we know that this has uh, lasting effects for nervous system, or I'm sorry, for immune system function and for cardiac function and all those things. So don't overthink this one. And the, the biggest uh, point on that one is to think in terms of capacity and robustness, you know, so again, it's not being able to bust out a 550, you know, mile time or anything like that. It's about being able to do whatever it is you do or train however you train for extended periods of time, both in individual sessions and uh, collectively or cumulatively, and being able to go hard, you know, without getting tired. Um, if you're too tired to train, your training sucks. Um, that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, an improved aerobic capacity will allow uh, even predominantly anaerobic athletes to saturate and optimize their training. This is something that I've seen in person. This is something that I've seen uh, from a lot of the people that I respect and follow and, and you know, look up to. Um, you, can just, you can just do more, you can be better, and you can do it more frequently. Um, you know, repeatability being a good term to latch onto there. You know, you got to go every single day. And in my world, um, working with the tactical athletes, it is literally every single day. Uh, there is no off season. So uh, we have to make sure that we're accounting for the factors uh, you know, out of the gate here. One of my favorite quotes to live by fatigue makes cowards of us all. So make fatigue hard to find. Um, that's really what I'm looking at with the aerobic system is just making fatigue more difficult to find. Um, some of the things that we've seen with approved aerobic function, um, you're approved, you have an improved ability to recover, right? And, you know, we all know the, the importance that we put on recovery, but, um, if you aren't training, hard enough to need recovery, then what are we here for to begin with, right? And like we started out by saying, you've got to be in shape to train hard. And if you train hard, you need to be able to recover hard. Um, you know, consider also the effects on sleep, hydration, cardiac function, circulation, immune function, cognition, and nervous system. Um, I didn't want to get, uh, I was kind of, you know, anxious to put this thing out. So I didn't want to get too deep into research and stuff on, on this kind of stuff. But you know, go take a look at it. It's, it's not hard to find. The aerobic system has an effect on just about everything. Last thing with the aerobic system is, is it has a long, oh yeah, look at that right on cue, include studies. Um, <laughs> you have a long training residual or training history uh, with the aerobic system. So if you can run a six minute mile, right, you get in shape and work up to running a six minute mile, you have about 30 days, give or take, um, you know, to be able to repeat that and theoretically still be able to run a six minute mile uh, without having to do anything. So you don't have to do much. It doesn't have to consume much of your training calendar, but I definitely think that the aerobic system needs to be a consideration. Step two, get big muscles. Uh, this is the technical term for hyper, or this is uh, the technical term here is hypertrophy. Um, so for muscular hypertrophy, primary benefit, we're looking at increasing cross-sectional area uh, increasing cross-sectional area creates greater muscular density. Increased density means increased uh, active myosin bridges. More bridges equals more opportunity for contraction. So it's not all about just, you know, looking good in your t-shirt and your tank tops. Uh, there's, a, there's definitely a, you know, foundational importance to hypertrophy. Um, some of those lesser discussed benefits, uh, increased tendon and ligament, ligamentous thickness. Um, we have thicker tendons. We're probably going to be able to transfer uh, 
absorb and transfer, you know, greater energy stores. Increased number of muscle fibers, uh, you know, again, more fibers, more opportunity for contraction. And then I think there's also a neuromuscular adaptation here as well, um, you know, tying in the, uh, the eccentrics that are typically utilized or emphasized in, in hypertrophy phases. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of evidence that there's some neuromuscular adaptations with hypertrophy training as well. Some of the nuts and bolts to this, uh, we're thinking higher volume, 6 to 12 reps, about moderate intensity. Uh, I, I, I do everything as either below 60 above 80 or between 60 and 80%. So hypertrophy is going to fall right in that 60 to 80 window. And we want moderate rest time, 60 to 90 seconds. Hypertrophy training should look very fluent and machine-like. Uh, so superficially, as you're observing your athletes as a coach, um, if we're trying to work hypertrophy and we see kids, you know, regardless of whatever the percentage is, we see athletes struggling to complete the reps, we're probably not getting hypertrophy work. Um, this should be very fluent, very smooth, very machine-like. And even if we're doing higher rep sets, um, those final reps, rep 8, rep 9, rep 10, those should be pretty clean as well. Um, as I mentioned, this pairs very well with eccentric emphasis. Um, and some of the nuanced methods here, you know, we're looking at overload methods, partial ROMs, and exaggerated ROMs. Um, you know, again, usually under those slower concerted tempos. Once we get big muscles, then we want to make those big muscles strong what good is all that growth if it isn't functional? So we have to remember that our body, our athletes are not bodybuilders. Um, everything in our world is about performance and about improving their ability on the field or court or, or in, in duty. So um, that's priority A, B, and C. So if we, uh, if we think about this in isolated terms, you know, we want to think about the the continuity or the strength of the hamstrings versus the quads or the strength of the glutes versus the flexors. If we think about it in global terms, we just want to look at, you know, what those numbers are on a back squat or a clean or a, a bench, right? So there's kind of two different applications or, or considerations here with this. First, we want to develop a general foundational strength. Um, so kind of going back to our conventional laws here, uh, it's, it's uh, very important that we have a good, robust base before we start getting into anything aggressive or, or specific. Um, nuts and bolts here, thinking lower reps, one to five reps, uh, definitely higher intensity, so in that 80% up, and we're gonna rest as long as we need. I put three to plus minute, three plus minutes here, but you know, for my athletes who are really pushing you know, some, some considerable weight, uh, I'll tell them to simply take what they need. And for some of them, it's, it's below that three minute mark. And for some of them, it's closer to that five minute mark. But the goals for that day are very simple. Do the weight that's on the bar. Strength phases should be grueling. They should be demanding and enduring. Um, you know, the, this is the one part of the, uh, calendar or training calendar, um, that we should definitely feel like we're being worked. Um, we should not be feeling fresh during the strength phases. Um, and you know, this all, strength work also typically pairs well with isometric works. Some of the nuanced, uh, applications with strength work, positional strength, you know, finding, uh, value in, in quarter or half range squats, or we're working, you know, maybe bottom range or end range positions. Um, you know, really my, my goal with that is to find where they're weak and, and try to hammer it. Uh, contrast methods. We already talked about that a little bit, but you know, we're looking at those potentiation clusters, some overspeed stuff, some ballistic stuff, and just general overload. You know, so, uh, you know, on days you're feeling good, just throwing 110 or 115 percent on the bar and, you know, doing that for some partial reps or for some assisted reps. Step four, make strong muscles fast. So for this, we're, we're thinking about our power phase. Um, and one thing that, you know, I really always try to think about with power is that just as different load intensities create different neuromuscular adaptations, the same is, uh, the same is true for, for speed, right? You know, we do something super slow. We do something as fast as we can. There is a different, you know, muscular physiological contraction going on. Um, and I think another thing with, uh, power work is it, this shouldn't be confused for something that's only appropriate for high level athletes. Power is a very relative thing. Um, you know, just to point, uh, just to paint a, a picture here, uh, I was working with a guy who uh, was a stroke victim a couple years ago, 
And, um, you know, I was just very, I was wrapping my head around just how to do things different for him and, and, and try some different things. And, you know, I was like, well, let's, let's look at some ways we can try and train, try and train some speed. And first thing that came to mind was give him a baseball bat and a punching bag and just let him swing a bat against the bag. And it worked perfectly, you know, so for, for him at that time, and obviously that being an extreme example, um, you know, that was very much power training for him. Um, big part with power is that intent drives adaptation. This is true for, for anything, but, but really, especially here, because you're typically working with very light percentages. It's easy to just kind of go through the motions when you have 45% on your, your bench press, right? Um, you have to treat 45% like it's 110% every single time. Um, it should feel effortless, but it should not be treated as such. Reps should feel sharp and crisp. Um, we want to finish all the way through the end range with aggression and intent. Um, when you finish a power workout or a power phase, we should be re recharged and, and not depleted. You know, like we were saying with uh, strength, it should be grueling and exhausting. Power is the total opposite. We should feel fresh coming out. Um, kind of touched on it already, but yeah, know your population. Everything's relative. Um, it's not just cleans, jerks, throws. It's, it, you know, it's much, much broader than that. And, you know, I think, uh, another good way to, to kind of build some, uh, robustness here is, is to consider multi-directional applications. You know, people can be very strong or powerful or fast in the sagittal plane, but what about the frontal nuts and bolts for power? We're still thinking low rep, one to five reps. Uh, lower, low intensities, right? Below 60%. And for a lot of people, that's weird at first, but I promise you, it needs to be light. Uh, we're still thinking long rest times. I'll still give my athletes the, the instruction of take what you need. Um, on power work, however, you need to kind of stay on top of them and make sure that they're not just going, you know, 60 seconds or so. Like we, we really need to rest, even if it doesn't feel like it, because we want that speed effect. Um, Power work should stimulate but not exhaust the CNS, and this obviously pairs well with reactive emphasis. So some of the nuanced methods here, ballistic movements, contrast methods, potentiation, overspeed ballistics, um, and oscillatory perturbation work are all good candidates for power. Once we finish up our power cycle, boom, rest, rinse, wash, repeat. Uh, Deload doesn't mean be a, a lazy piece of shit for a couple weeks. It means that you have time to do other things that you didn't have time to while you were training. Um, so this is a great opportunity to kind of fill the gaps here. Um, we don't want to just unwind from the previous training cycle, but also already start prepping for the next. And if we think about it from that lens, you know, you want to do all that you can to put yourself in the best position to start that next training phase. Um, use this time for, for including uh, uncommon movements, training parameters. Uh, think outside the box a little bit. Have fun. Do different shit. Uh, try to keep it low impact, low intensity, because again, we're, we're trying to prep for our next real training cycle. But literally anything is fair game. And I mean, especially if you have kids or young athletes, do whatever the hell you want. Um, you know, get them thinking, get them moving, have fun, interact. Uh, <laughs> once, <laughs> once we're done with COVID, that is, I guess. Um, utilize your time, right? So again, you know, this is, this is time to, to take advantage of the things that are always pushed to the back burner or pushed to the side. So we think about things like sleep hygiene, nutritional panel, stress management. You know, if, um, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, you have athletes who are, who are just constantly stressed and always freaked out or anxious, or you know, maybe somebody just had a bad breakup or got a bad score on a test, you know, this is the time where you can put some of those other things in place, you know, to try to alleviate those stressors in the next training cycle. But if it's always just the same lip service back and forth, you know, oh, my grades are bad. Oh, we need to do better on your tests. Uh, you're never really doing anything that's pragmatic. So I always like to think about everything as, as time opportunistic. So there's always a chance to do something. It's just a matter of what it is. Um, you know, some of these external modalities are also, uh, you know, perfectly fit for these deload phases. Uh, I, I'm, I'm definitely not here to, to tell you or, you know, debate about, you know, external modalities, but everyone has their own beliefs and preferences. Do whatever you like. Um, there's research to validate or disclaim pretty much anything. Uh, some of the ones that I like or have had success with soft tissue therapy, float tanks, chiropractic, dry needling. Um, you know, all of those things are tough to fit in when you have classes all day, training from, you know, six to eight, and then you got to go to study hall, and then you got to wake up next morning and go to conditioning or film, right? It's, it's tough to fit some of these things in. So when you have time, utilize it. Putting it all into action here. <clears throat> Nothing changes except for everything. 
That's really all it is. We're just constantly uh, changing and, and modifying variables and uh, controlling all the different factors at play. So, you know, if we look at this as a cyclical process, you know, step one, aerobic capacity, GPP, couple weeks, transition into hypertrophy, two to four weeks, muscular strength, two to four weeks, power, two to four weeks, and then we're back to deload. Um, the one thing, you know, we want to be mindful of on this end of it here is, you know, we don't want to deload for two weeks and then go into three weeks of, of GPP. That obviously isn't going to, you know, be effective for many people. So, you know, I think one one week is, is plenty, plenty sufficient for a deload unless it's a situation where you're really coming off of a heavy, heavy training cycle or, um, you know, if a sports season just ended, that might be a little bit different. But usually a week is, is, is perfectly fine for deloading. And then aerobic capacity GPP, I go back to my, my variable of 60 beats per minute. You know, if, uh, if somebody's, um, you know, got a resting heart rate of, of 55, I'm not going to spend three weeks doing GPP. Um, you know, we'll hit it for a week and then move on. Now, if I have somebody whose resting heart rate is 92, um, maybe we do need three weeks of just playing in GPP and, and getting moving and getting in shape, right? So it's always variable. It's always flexible. Um, coming back here a little bit. have my slides out of order here, but, um, you know, we look at the periodization 101, right? Linear versus conjugate is, is, a, is a good place to start. Um, I think personally that, that both are fine. Both have application. It's never really an either or thing, but, um, linear programs introduce moderately and progress chronologically. So you know what to expect. You, you, you know, what's coming up ahead. And for that reason, I think that linear tends to be better suited for young, novice athletes and then also for for group athletes because you know you want to manage those variables but conjugate programming um those are either weekly undulating or daily undulating or you can have a combination of the two but weekly undulating meaning that um if we have linear training that is muscular endurance for three weeks and then we have hypertrophy for three weeks and then strength for three weeks weekly undulating is just going to arrange that as hypertrophy strength, power, week one, two, three, and then those will repeat again and repeat again and repeat again to create the 12 weeks. For daily undulating, a lot of different ways to go about this, but basically we we're looking at a high volume day, a high intensity day, and a dynamic effort day throughout each given week. So a lot of different ways that you can split that up. Basic conditioning parameters. I just use the three different modes of aerobic capacity, lactate threshold, and max VO2. So with aerobic capacity, we're thinking long, slow distance and continuous, about 20 to 60 minutes, lower heart rate ranges. Lactate threshold is your, your kind of mid-distance interval training, you know, those tempo type runs, um, two to one type work, work rest ratio, and we'll be in a pretty mid-range heart rate. Max VO2, this is our high energy short burst, this is where we're starting to think longer rest periods and, and pretty much 100% effort, you know, max effort on our work ranges. But what it all boils down to is, again, just managing variables and managing time. You have to be flexible as the coach. You have to be able to put the athlete in the best position to succeed. And it's really on you to understand, you know, how to uh, manipulate the variables to create that effect, right? There is no right way to do it except for the right way to do it. So bringing this all back together now, uh, kind of going to take a look at, you know, how this applies to me and, and how I utilize this. And again, a lot of this is pretty non-conventional, um, but hopefully I can, I can kind of illustrate my point here with this. So everything starts with the assessment when we're talking about programming. <clears throat> with the assessment, what we're looking at is conducting a thorough comprehensive evaluation. And uh, really the big point on this one is you want to make them feel welcomed and excited, not intimidated and overwhelmed, right? It really, really bothers me when I see coaches. And fortunately, I don't see this at VHP, obviously. But, you know, in the past, you know, it's like this indictment of 
everything that's wrong with them. And, and I think what coaches feel is that the more that they can kind of vomit up and, and, and tell them is dysfunctional, the better that they're going to look um, as a know-it-all or as a coach or whatever. That's, that's a bunch of shit. Um, nobody wants to be told how much they suck, especially on day one. So, you know, we should have an encouraging attitude about this and, and really be transparent about what we're doing. And if, you know, if we identify weaknesses and deficiencies and whatnot, most of those don't need to be shared with the athlete. It's just for us. Um, you know, if, if people ask questions, certainly answer them, but it, it, it's not a, uh, it's not a fear mongering thing. So we're just looking to establish a plan based off the information that we collected. Some of the things that, uh, that I try to take uh, advantage of on day one or early on is, you know, some of these intangible factors, right? Like confidence level. Or do they look excited or are they pumped to be here? Or do they, you know, kind of have their tail tucked between them? You know, this should influence how you approach them about things. The ones that are excited to be, be here and be with you, um, you know, you want to try to match that energy and meet it. On the opposite end, for, uh, you know, the athletes who are more intimidated or a little reserved to be with you, you know, bring yourself down to their level and, and kind of, you know, try to work them through it, you know, to build their confidence up. You don't want to try to double down and, and make them feel more intimidated. Um, what type of personality do they have? Are they expressive? Are they outgoing? Are they charismatic? Are they soft-spoken? What is it? Because again, this should kind of help to construct your, your process here. Um, some of the other things I'm looking at are, you know, motor control, balance, and coordination, just general. How do they walk? How do they move? How do they get out of their chair? Um, you know, just little breadcrumbs that you can continue to pick up on. Really what I look at when it's all said and done, in terms of injury that is, um, do they look like they are more likely to be injured because they are too soft to endure it or too stiff to avoid it? And that will kind of set the theme for, for how I'm going to go about putting their stuff together. My process, here's what, here's kind of what I look like. Uh, you know, we're going to start out uh, interview and background. Big emphasis on training and injury history. I think training history is something that gets pushed to the side a little too much. If they tell you that they had success doing 5-3-1, don't have them go out and do CrossFit workouts. You have to stick with what they've had success with. And that's not to say you don't expose them to new things, but especially if you're working with adults, you know, like in my case, I don't work with anybody who's under like 25. Um, you know, they have a pretty good idea of what works for them. So it's important that you trust that. Um, this is always a two way street. I promise I'm not going to get fully into all the different assessment stuff here. Um, I have tons of articles on assessment. So if you need more on this, just please check that out. But we're going to make sure we do a static assessment where we're identifying loose relationships and getting a general feel for the athlete, a table assessment, where we're going to look at joint by joint, you know, what those boundaries and restrictions are. And then we're going to bring it together with a dynamic assessment and see how everything functions organically with little instruction. Uh, special populations considerations. This is something that's big in my world. Um, again, won't get too deep into this, but it's very different, you know, programming for somebody who, you know, is coming off of about a cancer or, you know, just coming off of a major back surgery, doesn't have a left arm. It just changes things. Um, testing. So this is something that's not too prevalent in my world, but very prevalent in most of yours, I'd imagine. You know, coaches want to, sport coaches want to see numbers. Parents want to see numbers. Uh, did we get better in the six weeks that we just paid you to be, get better for? Um, so it's important if you have testing measures that you make sure that those testing procedures are being trained in training. Um, and kind of along similar lines, keeping the goal the goal. You know, if somebody comes to you and wants to lose 20 pounds, you need to do things that make them or help them to lose 20 pounds. Um, it is their time, not yours. <clears throat> Mapping it out, uh, you know, this is uh, something that in my world is is uh, pretty, pretty variable. But again, working with who I work with, most of them are going to be pretty interested in what they're doing. So the way I always present it to them is, you know, I'm an open book. I'll tell you as much or as little as you want to know. And I have some guys who need to know, or some athletes who need to know every single step of the process. And then I have other athletes who don't give a shit about anything that I'm doing. And I'll, I'll meet them wherever they are on that spectrum. 
typical case for me. Um, you know, I've kind of alluded to a lot of this, but almost all of my uh, population has concussion history, TBI history. Um, you know, so there's there's vestibular implications on that. There's balance issues on that. There's instruction implications on that. So a lot of things coming with uh, the concussion and TBI history. Uh, everyone almost has a, a shoulder injury, whether it's a slap or a, a cuff tear. Um, we'll get some uh, some elbows, wrists, hands from now, you know, every now and again. Um, back is definitely a big one. Almost everyone has had either um, some kind of herniation or compression, if not surgery. Um, feet, ankles, shins usually banged up. Um, and then we'll get the occasional, you know, knee injury as well. But this is this is pretty consistent for what <clears throat> what I see. Um, you know, we see CPAP up here, um, medication for nerve block, you know, those are some of the, uh, the lesser discussed variables that you want to make sure you stay on top of too. But this is, this is what it all boils down to, right? Training goals. What do they want to get from you? So your methods, your, your practices, your programs all have to meet what they need or want. And the best part of it is they will show you what they need, right? That's the whole point of the assessment. They're giving you the answers to the exam. So if we have a slap, a lumbar, ulnar, poor gait, poor posture, motor control, vestibular problems, here are some of the things that we're going to look to do. Slap repair, restore flex, overhead flexion. Once we restore overhead flexion, then we want to start to add, add load to it. Give it stability, give it strength. Um, clean up the scapular patterns and, and restore internal external rotation for the humerus. For the lumbar compressions, uh, this is a little bit vague and ambiguous on my part, but um, obviously we want to decrease low back pain. Um, I think that the best way to go about this is to train everything around it. You don't really need to do much for the back specifically, at least initially, um, but you want to improve core strength. You want to improve the, the psoas and hamstring relationships, um, getting the glutes going, and, and I think for a lot of them too, just getting them moving outside of what they're accustomed to moving, right? You know, my, my population is, is inherently sagittal plane dominant. So a lot of the times just getting them moving in the frontal plane will alleviate back pain, to, believe it or not. Um, the ulnar nerve, <clears throat> this, these can be, um, you know, some of these like UCL injuries and, um, you know, long thoracic nerve injuries. Some of these can be in, incredibly tricky. And honestly, I, I do not have a, a, a very high success rate with, um, you know, some of these, but working in a multimodal fashion, uh, nerve injuries even still tend to, to take some time. But, you know, I try to focus on hand and grip strength and endurance and, you know, working dexterity and, uh, you know, soft tissue work is a big part of this too. For the disruptive gait, um, this again is really just kind of a global approach. We're just trying to reduce the presence of muscular guarding because a lot of the times that really is what inhibits gait is you know, athletes are locked up up top, so they don't have an arm swing. And if you don't have an arm swing, it's going to change your kinematics at your hips, and then your hips are going to change your kinematics at your gait. So it's it's really just trying to kind of look at them and how they move globally and, and seeing what we can improve upon um, to help clean that up. Uh, kind of the same thing with motor control and vestibular. You know, I'm not going to do anything overly spe uh, specific for this, um, but we're always going to be working on it. Kind of a deeper dive here, really just touching on the same stuff. Um, you know, maybe this is a good slide to, to screenshot here. Um, I don't want to go through this line by line, but, you know, really, again, the, the whole point of this is just what are you observing during your assessment and what are you going to do to make this better? And you're not going to hit 100% of the time, but it's important that you at least approach it as you, you intend to. Big thing uh, here for me is establishing boundaries. Um, so loosely, I will classify my athletes as red, blue, or green. Um, this is really, you know, significant injury or even catastrophic injury in some cases. Um, and, you know, we're going to be day by day. Uh, you know, I'm not going to plan anything out. Uh, we'll have a loose idea of what we need to touch on, and we'll take it day by day. Blue, this is really just kind of your maintenance group. So, you know, either people who, um, you know, some of my athletes are in their 40s or 50s and, and even older, um, and they just want to stay in good shape and in good health. And, you know, so really there's nothing specific here. We're just going to kind of 
touch on a bunch of different stuff and, and you know, kind of keep them right where they're at and hopefully improve a little bit in a few different areas. My green athletes, these are the ones that are the go-getters and, and, you know, we need to make tangible improvements in X, Y, or Z. So you can see how that correlates down here. You know, if we're working upper strength, dynamic strength, or lower strength for the red group, we may go landmine press, and honestly, it may be even lower than this. Uh, you know, it may be just like a band press, um, and then something like a kettlebell waiter carry. <clears throat> For my blue group, go into a single arm landmine and a pull apart, and then we look at a green green athlete, and we have bench press and tricep push down. So, you can see as we go across here on each of these, um, you know, we're training the same stuff, but we're doing it in a different way. The dumbbell goblet squat for the red athlete is going to be just as effective as the back squat is for the green athlete. So, you know, you can be somebody who trains upper body, lower body, total body, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but if you have an athlete who can't bench press, you need to find a way for them to be able to train that upper body day, um, you know, that isn't going to push them too far or put them in a bad spot. And then equally on the opposite end, you'd never want to under train somebody. We talked quite a bit about this. Um, I'll kind of skim through these here, but <clears throat> in my world, you know, head trauma, neuromuscular function, and vestibular and proprioception are, are all big things that need to be addressed. Um, you know, we have the 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 more obvious ones, the shoulders, the degenerative discs, and the repeat stressors. Um, but really, you know, my world is built around, uh, you know, re rehabbing injuries while not compromising performance at the same time. Some of their demands, reactiveness, agility, perceptual movement. Uh, they got to be able to run long distance, a lot of the times under load, carrying, hauling things, but they also need to have reactive short burst, anaerobic speed, and power. Um, for some of my athletes, you know, parachute jumps, exposure to G-forces, those have, ex uh, you know, exceptional considerations for training. Um, you know, climbs, hikes, terrains, hypoxic environments, uneven training conditions. You know, I know the uh, unstable surface training argument has been beaten to shit for the last 10 years but look man there there are some people where that that really does have application and, and my world happens to be one of them um got a repeater there uh fast roping and obstacles so really just you know complex challenges and i think what it really boils down to for for at least some of my athletes is you know really preparing for the unpreparable i mean let's face it uh you know going going to war is pretty impossible to train for. So, you know, we have to kind of keep that in mind, at least for, for some of our athletes. <clears throat> really, they're a jack of all trades, though. That's that's all it boils down to, and we'll get into that here in a sec. But, um, you know, it, it's got to be an equal equal blend of a lot of different things. Uh, some of them have very abnormal requirements, demands, and circumstances. And then considering kind of the, uh, the wear and tear that accumulates, you know, some of these athletes have had 20, 25, 30-year careers. Uh, you know, that's a lot of things to be exposed to. Um, you know, sympathetic parasympathetic balance is another one that's big for them. And, and most of them live in that sympathetic realm. So we're actually trying to, uh, you know, de, de or, you know, not stimulate them a lot of the times in, in training. Um, spinal considerations is huge. You know, people who have had, uh, you know, lumbar compressions or lumbar, uh, you know, microdisectomies and, and thoracic injuries, you know, we probably don't want to spend too much time under a back squat bar for them. Um, same thing being with, you know, surgical and repeat injuries on the opposite end. This is a very high energy, highly competitive and high intensity group. So, you know, one of the trickiest parts of my work is trying to trick people to, to slow down. You know, we don't have to do as much as we can until we're on the verge of vomiting every single time we, we train, putting it all together here. Sports specific training equals demands of your sport plus weaknesses and deficiencies identified. That is literally it. So whatever the energy system demands are, whatever the movement plane demands are, plus whatever you see that they are weak or, or uh, deficient in is exactly what the, the specificity and individualization boils down to. Um, you gotta understand the timelines and, and the important dates that are coming up um, so that you can plan accordingly. But again, they literally give you the answers to the test. So don't overthink your exercise selection. Start general, work to more specific, but don't confuse specificity with skill work.
athletes have practice for a reason, you know, and again, in my world, they have their training for a reason. I, I don't need to simulate, you know, different, you know, tactical whatevers, um, you know, in the gym. That's not what they're, that's not what they're coming to me for. So make sure you're doing your job as best you can and, and not trying to, you know, double down on what they already have uh, coming elsewhere. So if we break these down real quick using a couple of examples, um, we look at a, a football skill player and, and for here, you know, a high school wide receiver. Um, this is a, and, and please, please do not, you know, bludgeon me over this. This is just a loose idea of what's needed for a football skill athlete, right? We have about 50% anaerobic capacity and power, 20% muscular strength, 20% aerobic capacity and strength endurance, 10% pliability, bending, and tissues, right? So, um, and look, we can, we can argue and debate about the exact percentages here all day, but the point is this is generally what their, their sport demands. So we look at that, and then we look at what they show us, you know, history of a meniscus tear, ankle sprain, separated shoulder, compromised change of direction, and limited weak overhead flexion, right? So this is what they're telling us that they need. We look at their testing, you know, 484 for a, four, uh, for a you know, senior wide receiver, that could probably be worked on a little bit. And, you know, we look at um, the vertical, that could probably be worked on a little bit. But, you know, you want to look and see what is glaring and what is, is, is clearly weak or deficient and match it to what they need, you know, so if I had thrown in here like, you know, eight and a half minute mile um, or, you know, a marathon time, obviously that's not an important variable for them. So we don't need to work, work on it too much or worry about it. We take this to a, a college basketball player, Achilles rupture in high school, teller tendinopathy, adductor strain, Excessive anterior pelvic drop plus overpronation and weak anterior trunk and hamstrings, right? So what does their sport demand? What did they show us they need? That's what you're looking at. For me, we notice now 25, 25, 25, 25, right? Equal blend across the board. So we look at all their injury history. We look at the assessment findings, and again, for me, I'm not doing too much, you know, diagnostic testing, but, um, you know, just getting an idea of where they sit against these variables of need and, and training what's weak. Looking at the difference here, sport versus tactical athletes, we have um, a defined off-season for sport athletes. We do not for tactical. The, ath the athlete training is going to be refined, specific, and linear where the tactical athlete is going to be broad, non-specific, and non-linear. Um, you know, and again, timelines on this end are, are, you know, we're thinking like deployments or work trips or, or, you know, extended time away. So, you know, we have to be very careful with how we go about putting our program together. Training emphasis, improve necessary skills, enhance uh, skill required in sport, improve robustness and durability, rehab injuries without compromising strength. This is just a battle of attrition. We are just trying to make them more resilient to whatever they're going to be exposed to. Most injuries in sport world are going to be acute and situational, where most athlete or most tactical athlete injuries are going to be, uh, you know, accumulative or chronic, and and can be wide reaching. Can also be very severe and complicated. You know, so uh, a lot of this world is, is is undefined in the in the strength training world. Uh, there is exposure to head trauma in, in both. Uh, this is going to be very common. I would say sport athletes are more somewhat common, but. We also have blast exposures and direct blows in, in the tactical athletes world. This is a big one here for me. Uh, for most athletes, I would say this is probably a secondary factor. Um, you know, especially younger athletes because they're just not going to have enough time yet to really be uh, compromising general wellness. Now, if you work with professional athletes or some division one athletes, this could be more of a considerable factor. But for me, um, Almost every single person I work with has sleep deprivation uh, or impaired or disrupted sleep. Uh, Psycho-emotional disorders are prevalent. Um, and, you know, a lot of their just general stress management and, and wellness skills are, are compromised due to the demands of work. So we have to consider that in training. I'm going to kind of cruise through this here. I'm already coming up on this hour mark and I didn't want to take this long. But um, 
laying it all or putting it all together here, we want to try to layer our training and, and just continue to add, you know, density to the wheel here. Um, time blocks, I've spoken about this on numerous occasions, but I swear it's the biggest change I've made to my programming. Um, this to me is just a way of creating auto regulation, right? We don't want to live and die by an Excel sheet. Uh, our job is to facilitate, not hinder. So the time blocks have allowed me to, you know, let somebody get six sets of four if they have six sets in them, uh, rather than just writing it as three sets of four and then leaving them hanging. And then on the opposite end, on days where they're not feeling great, you know, instead of trying to, you know, drudge your way through six sets, uh, get three or four good ones and keep it pushing. Tempos, in my opinion, are the, the best progression most people are missing, right? Instead of looking at changing the exercise or changing the equipment, um, add some tempos to it. It, it, will, it will do wonders for your athletes. Um, this is a, another way of also just, you know, really identifying where the weak links in the chain are, and we want to try to address those weak links. Um, and a lot of the times we can expose that through uh, tempo work. Intraset and warm-up. So my intraset work is, is basically what I'm pairing with my, my primary lift. So my bench press, back squat, deadlift, hang clean. Um, this for me is a big way to maximize the time. Uh, I think that, you know, instead of just standing around bullshitting for three minutes, four minutes in between sets, you know, we can have them do some soft tissue work, some independent strength or mobility work um, that does not compete or fatigue the, the primary lift. Um, <clears throat> but it gives us, you know, something tangible to work on, uh, you know, and, and again, just try to saturate our time, especially in the private sector, time is, is of the essence, so you got to make the most of it. Warm up, you know, we all know the, 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 the basics of a warm up, right? Increase body temperature, circulation, increase activation, stimulate CNS, joint viscosity, synovial fluids. My big thing is athletes should hardly be able to tell where the warm up ends and the training starts, right? It should be a seamless transition. Uh, don't just, you know, throw a mini band on them and, and have them do dead bugs and then get on a bike for 10 minutes. It's, that's, that's bullshit. Um, you're setting the tone for the day. Uh, I, I'm very big on having the athletes be conscious while they're warming up so that their mind and, and you know, they're, they're stimulating their, their, their cognition as much as anything else. Um, and we, all, of course, want to make sure we're addressing specific needs for the daily training. Accessories. Um, so for me, this is really where uh, we are bread and butter for specificity. I, I think that most athletes need to do most of the same shit. We all got to squat, press, hinge, pull, lunge, locomotive, run. Um, but although 75% needs to be the same or, you know, is going to be reasonably the same, that 25% could outweigh the 75% in a lot of cases, right? So we need to make sure that we're honing in on what they need. And I think in that third block or that accessory block, that's really where we can start to program exactly what each individual needs. couple last slides here, uh, you know, offset methods are another way that I've used, uh, you know, progressing athletes without just putting more weight on the bar. I think there's an unbelievable amount of benefit to offset loading. This is another one that I have a ton of different articles on. So I'll kind of let you check those out at your own interest, but just know that this is another way that we can kind of add, <clears throat> you know, density or, uh, layering to our, to our athletes. And you knew you weren't going to be able to watch anything from me without hearing about the core. So, Yep, I think the core is a real thing. Uh, please, for the love of God, stop writing core in quotations. It drives me insane. Um, it's a real thing, man. It, it's a part of the human body, and it's a major part of human performance and, and movement. So, um, you know, when we think about the core, we're thinking about something that directly acts on, attaches to uh, the spine, pelvis, or rib cage, contributes to spinal stabilization, pelvic control, or mechanical function of the pillar, and facilitates uh, absorbing and transmitting forces between extremities. So, you know, I think that this is something that, again, for anybody has, has value, but especially in my world, this is often a major, major piece. Um, you know, core is extremely wide-reaching. Uh, once we, we establish a good definition for it, um, you know, we see that there are a lot of different things that are involved with the core. <clears throat> when we're thinking about progressing core movements, and really this list can apply to just about anything, um, you know, we want to look at changing the, the lever, right? So doing a chop with the hands close to the body first and then doing them with the arms fully extended. Those are two different effects. Uh, changing the angle, going from high to low, um, going from short to long, you know, again, those, those have effects. 
uh, changing the position of the stance, changing the tempo. You know, we can do the same exercise all across the way here with different levers, different angles, different positions, and different tempos and get a different effect. So really look at, uh, you know, how you can manage these, uh, these progressions. On a little bit of a deeper scale, we're thinking robustness and global, right? Just building the resiliency, wide spectrum of movements, smooth, controlled, heavily coached, um, static and performed in a, you know, comfortable position. Then we're going to go to a simplicity isolated. So de-emphasizing uh, the focus of fatigue, looking more at refined movement, uh, predominantly uniplanar, unidirectional, unidirectional and uh, mostly static exercises here. And then we get into more of the complex side of it. So this is where we start getting into movement combinations, varying tempos, multi-directional, multi-segmental. Um, and then this, this final stage here, we're looking at, um, you know, refining what we're starting to improve upon and introducing new vectors and introducing, uh, you know, new angles um, to try to bring the whole picture together here. <laughs> and lastly, here on this, we have, um, you know, perturbation, oscillatory, offset, unbalanced, impulse management, some of these nuanced methods. Uh, again, not really the time or place for me to get too deep into these. Uh, I have some articles on them, but these are all things that, that you know, really can kind of... Um, tie up the loose ends of, of programming. In conclusion here, <clears throat> don't stray too far from your conventional laws, right? Don't outsmart what's been proven. Um, if overload is not present, adaptation will not occur. Really all this other shit listed on here, none of it matters if this is not fully understood and then applied, right? You cannot outsmart the basics. At the same time, anecdotal evidence shouldn't be belittled. I've done a lot of things that, you know, quote unquote, research hasn't proven or, or, or even in some cases, research is, uh, you know, proven the opposite direction. But I've found success with it over and over and over and over again. So, you know, go ahead and uh, cast your stones at me and, and, you know, tell me I'm wrong on that. But I'm going to I'm going to very much consider what I've seen firsthand work for me. So. Um, and I'm also aware of the contradictions that I live by, so you don't need to point that out either. Um, you're never married to anything. Remember, you know, different things work for different people. Uh, I think what's most important is that the program needs to make sense to you as the coach, and you need to be able to implement it thoroughly with your athletes. Um, but you're never married, so always, always continue to try to refine that wheel. Programming is cyclical. It is never static. So again, kind of along similar lines. Um, you know, always look to be evolving how you're going about things and, and, you know, looking at ways that you can fill gaps and, and, you know, maybe improve some things. Um, but really at the end of the day, we're just managing variables and making informed decisions. Don't, <clears throat> don't look beyond what the athlete shows you. All right. Um, I think it's extremely important to take your assessment, you know, as serious as anything else in training and, uh, you know, really be thorough with that and, and allow it to kind of guide your, your coaching. Um, and that to include exercise selection and programming. Once the foundational elements have been established, look to venture out, you know, and, and again, I, none of my athletes that I work with are under 25. They're all extremely highly trained. So, you know, for some of the people that I'm seeing, it's, you know, I, I'm going to have to do some things differently than, than just the, the conventional nuts and bolts. Um, you know, and so although this doesn't apply to everybody and every athlete, um, you know, when it does, when it is prudent, you know, explore beyond the foundations. And that's about it. Um, you know, thank you guys for uh, checking in. And uh, hopefully this is something that was uh, helpful to you and, and informative for you. Um, but man, really, uh, it is it is a weird, weird time right now. So um, genuinely, on, on behalf of Nicole and I, and, and, you know, I'll throw BHP in there too. Uh, you know, we just hope that you guys are, are doing well and, and, you know, hanging in there in, in these times of uncertainty. And, uh, Please, if there's anything that, you know, we can do, uh, setting up a call and, and talking shop or, or, you know, swapping notes or anything like that, you know, we'd be happy to, to try to at least help occupy your time, if nothing else. But um, thank you guys again for, for tuning in here. And, and uh, I'm going to be looking to do a couple more of these. So, uh, you know, please uh, feel free to give me some feedback and let me know what you think. <clears throat>